discussing about <coughs> meditation teachings and and uh, commenting on the fact that uh, if you go to see this this uh, particular teacher, one particular teacher or another teacher or whichever particular meditation system that you're going to, they all like to say that that you know this is like the real teaching that the Buddha taught. Yeah, this is the original one, and I, I made the very cynical <laughs> comment that that's just the PR spin, right? And uh, so then somebody responded quite reasonably, well, what's the PR, what's your PR spin? And so this is my PR for tonight, okay? <laughs> uh, the Santi Forest Monastery official PR spin propaganda. And, uh, and uh, as, as, as uh, interpreted by Sujato, Of course, you know, there is this thing, like if we, if we say we're teaching Buddhism or practicing Buddhism or at least interested in Buddhism, then uh, it has a certain uh, historical aspect to it, right? We use the word Buddha and, you know, the word Buddha carries us back in time, yeah, two and a half thousand years. And this is, of course, part of the appeal of it is that He's got this whole kind of romantic thing about the Buddha. The very fact that the Buddha is so distant from us in time and place gives him this aura. It's one of the things that gives him this aura of holiness or sanctity or profundity or whatever it may have been. And There are certain, there are few, only very few, but there are certain people, I think the Buddha is one of them, in, in human history or human culture, who, who there are certain words which carry uh, you know, a resonance for people, which in a sense, I think the Buddha is one of those very few words that for many people carries a despite everything, despite everything that's happened in the last two and a half thousand years, it still has this something about it. It carries more than what just the, the word means. It, it evokes something. It has a resonance. It still inspires faith. Like, say, the word Jesus does. But, but there's not many, yeah? Not many that are so... Um, I think quite universal, not completely, but but reason you know very very have a very widespread appeal <coughs> and so in a sense, by using the word Buddha and say we 're Buddhism, you know say we 're here we 're teaching a Buddhist class we 're teaching Buddhism, so of course what Buddhism is is a very um, uh, dubious or ephemeral term, it can mean just about anything you want it to mean. But in some ways, we're connecting it with that strand of tradition that goes back two and a half thousand years. And that invites a bit of reflection. And uh, we should ask ourselves, why bother? Why bother with the Buddha? Yeah, He was a who do, who, presumably he was, we, we use the word enlightened, we don't necessarily know what it means, presumably was a great spiritual master and all of these things, but really we don't know who the Buddha was. We have ideas, we have a faith. Why shouldn't we follow someone else? We can follow Eckhart Tolle or Deepak Chopra yeah? or Ken Wilber. Yeah? These people, we, we know these people, they exist. Yeah, we know we, if we've got a question about their teaching, we can ask them. Yeah? <laughs> Maybe they're enlightened. Yeah? I don't know, are they? Mm. But somehow there's something about the Buddha's teachings which mm, still motivates us, it still interests us, it still pulls us in some way. So there's a sense of rightness or a sense of truth about it or a sense of, um, you know, there's a sense of trust that comes from something which just lasts for so long. 
And so this kind of pulls us into this sphere of Buddhism that somehow we think that it has some depth, some answers that uh, it will repay not just a, a cursory study but will repay an in-depth study and practice for, for a lifetime, maybe many lifetimes. So we have to be, as, as I feel very much for myself as a Buddhist teacher, mm. that I have a certain responsibility in using the word Buddhism. Yeah? So I don't want to sort of, you know, market myself as a Buddhist teacher and then, and then be teaching something which is, you know, not, not Buddhism or is against Buddhism or something. So we have, a, I think, an obli obligation to try to find out what the Buddha actually taught why did he teach like that? What did it mean? And to uh, live that, right? So we're not, uh, we, we don't have like a, a just a, mere, a merely academic interest in Buddhism, yeah? We're not just sort of learning about it like a subject like we learn about everything else. Somehow there's an element of faith there. Which, which, which propels us, or which which um, encourages us to find in those teachings something which is meaningful for our lives, and not just to treat, treat it as a as a historical data. And this is that gap of faith, the gap between faith and knowledge. Yeah. The aura of the Buddha, right? This is the, the something else, the mysterious something else, which is conveyed through the use of the Buddha images. It's conveyed through the stories about the Buddha. It's conveyed through the attitude of reverence and devotion to the Buddha. All of these kind of um, uh, sort of non-rational uh, dimensions of a religion, and then that conveys that emotive response, that resonance that we have to the idea of the Buddha. Yeah, this is on one hand. But on the other hand, that, that emotive response or that resonance is tied down to a physical and historical reality. We can go to India, we can go to the vulture's peak where the Buddha lived and taught, we can go to Savati, to the Jeta Grove, and say this is the place where the Buddha sat, we can go to Bodhgaya where the Buddha became enlightened. It's an actual historical place. And so he was a human being. He walked on the earth. And to me, this is very important. And so for me, it's always been um, one of the things that I can't necessarily explain or anything about about my own practice or what's been in, interested me in Buddhism you know when I first people always ask you uh, if you're a monk they always ask you how did you get interested in Buddhism or something like that and of course there's 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 several different different versions of that story depending on how honest I want to be at the time but anyway uh, <laughs> one of the simple versions is that I was in Thailand and I ended up a I read a book about Buddhism, which I thought was all right. The first book I ever read was Ajahn Buddha Dasa's Handbook for Mankind. And then I went to uh, a monastery, Wat Rampung, and did a uh, meditation retreat there. So it's very nice for me at the moment. We have um, Mechi Aganyani is, is the uh, Thai nun who has been the teacher at Wat Rampung for the last 15 years, the translator for the Western people. I didn't know her when I was there. I think she came after my time, but she's now staying at Santi for the next couple of months, so it's very nice to have her there. Uh, so I did this very intensive meditation, about 27 days meditating, 14 hours a day. And one of the skillful things about the way that they taught meditation there was that they didn't actually tell you anything, which is kind of skillful 
if you didn't go mad, right? <laughs> Which I, was, I managed to just sort of stay on the near side of mad. Sometimes if you go a little bit further, you're perhaps not so skillful. But for me anyway, that was very good because, you know, no one was trying to persuade you of a particular dogma or teaching or anything like that. You just sit there and just suffer, basically. <laughs> so I learned a lot about suffering, you know, pain, bodily pain, back pain, sitting there with ants crawling all over you, sweating in the hot season in Chiang Mai, and so on and so forth. And so that was one thing. And then when I came out of that retreat, so that was one thing always very, very important for me, is actual experience of meditation. And that's, that's been something which has been completely incontrovertible in my whole life since then. It's, you experience it, you know it. Mind has changed. You know? Your mind has changed, and you know that. And there's nothing anybody can tell you that can, that can make any difference to that. And then the other thing that I did after I got out of the retreat, I said, you know, to the people there, can I have some books or something to read, learn a bit about Buddhism? And so they gave me a couple of books. The first one was, well, Paul Rahula's What the Buddha Taught. So I read that, and I thought that was quite nice. And then uh, they gave me a few other books of Dhamma talks by various people, and I read them, and I thought, is that it? It's pretty boring. <laughs> a lot of the, the teachers in the Ajahn Chah tradition a book called Seeing the Way, and I read that and I thought, oh, yeah, it's all right. And then I said, where's the real stuff? So he said, oh, here's the Majjhima Nikaya. So that was the end of that. Yeah. <laughs> so then I got into the Majjhima Nikaya, so that was, that's been it. So there's always been the two things for me, is meditation and the suttas, what the Buddha taught in the, in the suttas, especially the Pali Canon. And... Uh, that's how it's been since that time, you know. And and actually, I don't know very much about. Uh, uh, people ask me, you know, what's a good book on Buddhism, and I go, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't I haven't read any books on Buddhism for ten years or more, fifteen years. And uh, you know, books on meditation and books by various teachers and things. I don't I don't read that stuff, you know. I read the suttas, and things that are going to help me understand the suttas, uh, and then my meditation. But after a while, you know, you're doing meditation. After a while, you don't... It's a practical skill, yeah? When you're learning how to ride a bicycle, you need someone to show you how to do it. Once you know how to ride, you just <laughs> ride the thing, yeah? You don't need someone beside your side teaching you every day how to ride your bicycle, yeah? And so it's like that with meditation, that, you know, once we've got started and we've got a bit going, we know how to meditate. Then you just meditate. Problems happen, you sort them out. From time to time, you need guidance, and you can seek guidance, and and that's good. And especially in the early period, then yes, you know it's very good, very important to have some some guidance and some teaching. But then after a while, you begin to realize, well, there's there's wholesome and there's unwholesome. What's in your mind? What is in your mind right now? Yeah, is that wholesome or unwholesome? You know, greed, hatred, and delusion. These unskillful qualities they lead to suffering. I've seen that so many times. Yeah. You look into your own mind, you see, it's greed, hatred, and delusion, and then that leads to suffering. How many times have I seen that? How many times have I seen that today? How many times have I seen it this afternoon? Again and again and again, you see these things. So I don't, I don't, you don't need somebody to, to tell you about that. If you don't have greed, hatred, and delusion, it leads to happiness leads to lightness of heart. It leads to a sense of joy. And you don't need, you know, once you've got started, once you've learned how to look into your mind and investigate, you don't need somebody to tell you those things. So one of the things that I found quite early on from these two loves that I had, one was the love of meditation, the other one the love of the suttas, is that um, there's two things. One is that there was no doubt that the practice of meditation worked. Okay, you have done, you've done it, you've experienced. Yeah. You see, there's this there is this clarity, there is this mindfulness. Yeah? There is a different dimension on things, a different perspective on the world. 
there is a growing sense of wisdom and understanding, all of those things. That's a reality. That's one thing. Second thing that, that, you, that, that you can see from the suttas is that they speak to the same kinds of things. Okay? So the suttas are speaking to and for and about the same kinds of realities that you're experiencing in your meditation. Okay? And they also speak of these kinds of things that you know, one should abandon those qualities of mind that are unwholesome, that lead to suffering and so on. One should develop those good qualities of mind that lead to happiness and joy and freedom. Yeah, and these kinds of things we find again and again and again and again throughout the suttas. And uh, not only do they teach you those meditation teachings, they also put them in a, in a context of how to live. They give you guidelines in terms of precepts, livelihood, all of these kinds of things. Uh, and they also give a very profound philosophical context within which all of that stuff makes sense. Okay? So things like teachings on dependent origination. And these are teachings which uh, repay uh, a very kind of deep and, and, and long-term investigation and inquiry. <coughs> So this is what I found, I think, so those things are always good. But I also found something else, and that is that uh, there was, a, even, there was a, at some level, a disjunct between what I was taught in meditation, what I was told by the meditation teachers, and what I found in the suttas. Okay? Now, the first thing that this came up for me was that when I was doing this particular system as taught in, in um, Wat Rampung, uh, the Mahasi-based system, kind of a modified version of the Burmese Mahasi technique. And they're always talking about yanas. It's a Thai word, yana. Yan, they say in Thai. The Pali word is yana. And uh, they say there's this yan and, and this yan and the other yan. And uh, Pali word, yana. And I was looking through the suttas, and I couldn't find these yana things. Where are they? I was trying to, trying to find them, and they weren't there. But every sutra I read seems to be talking about these things called jhanas. And there's no jnana, I can't find any jnanas in there, but I can find these jhanas all over the place. And I, I, I don't know, what are they talking about? Um, the teachers are teaching me jnanas, and then now I'm talking about these, these jhanas, those things I read here. So I asked the teacher, what are, what are these jhana things? And they said, oh, these, oh, that's, the Buddha didn't say to practice them, that's only, what he, that's only what he practiced. But he didn't tell his disciples to practice them. And I was like, really? Oh, okay. So I kind of go back and reading the suttas again, and didn't seem to quite add up. So uh, you, can, you notice that there is a disjunct between some of the ways in which Dhamma is formulated and the teachings which you find in the suttas. Which doesn't necessarily... Uh, that, that disjunct m may or may not be of particular practical importance for any one person at any one time, right? Sometimes it doesn't matter, really. You know, you're just meditating, and however someone explains the meditation, it doesn't really matter, to be honest. Sometimes it may do, but a lot of times it probably doesn't. But certainly, if we want to pursue the matter more deeply, then we have to sort of follow these things through, and we have to use that kind of uh, sense of inquiry uh, to find these things out. So, uh, this, is, this, of course, is, is one of the things that that uh, I did, one of the things that I pursued um, through my own contemplation, what I learned through my own approach to meditation and so on, and through uh, uh, study of the suttas and, uh, and so on. The, one of the th little things that I noticed and it's just a little kind of moment's hesitation, but I remember it in my mind was that when I when I asked about, I'd heard about these things, the, the suttas, and I asked the, the the teacher there if I could read the the suttas. I noticed this kind of moment, this kind of little bit of hesitation or reluctance. Yeah. And uh, that's actually that that moment of hesitation or reluctance is actually extremely important to notice for the for the. 
for the for the nature of of religions yeah, and the nature of historical religions and that is that the teachings of the founder of the religion are deeply subversive of the actual established religion yeah just as in christianity if you read what jesus had to say and then you look at what the catholic church has done over the last couple of millennia you know well there's <laughs> There's a bit of there's a bit of an issue there, um, more than one issue, yeah, in terms of what it, its founder was teaching and what people have actually done. And of course, the same is true for Buddhism. And uh, so, the teachings of the founder are very subversive for the established religion. And the best historical example of this was in the case of Confucianism, because with uh, Confucianism, because Confucius probably was a historical person who lived a bit before the Buddha, and uh, <coughs> It was this kind of school, philosophical school established in China. And about, I think it was about uh, 100 AD or something like that, so about six or 700 years after Confucius lived, they demolished his house. And in the walls of his house, they found scrolls. And the scrolls had written on writings by Confucius himself, yeah? which they couldn't read by that time. Okay? The writing system had evolved. And they didn't know how to read these writings. So the Confucian scholars went back and studied, 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 and worked out how to read these things. Yeah? When they read them, of course, it was very, very disturbing because it wasn't actually the same thing as the Confucian schools were teaching. Yeah? So then they have a very serious problem. And that actually caused a schism in the Confucian movement, which has lasted in two, two major kind of movements of Confucianism until the present day, one based on the the reform movement based on what Confucius was actually saying and then the other based on the, the school which had developed after his time. And so we have the same thing within Buddhism. We find these things like, the, you know, the, you have like the Buddhist Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, these, these manuscripts that have been dug up in uh, Afghanistan and, and Central Asia and so on. And these are supposed to have some revelation for the nature of Buddhism and, and uh, Dr. Mark Allen from Sydney Uni is one of the people in, who's working on these things. Of course, the, 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 the difference with the, the Buddhist Dead Sea Scrolls, what they call them, again another PR spin, is that actually they just teach the same thing that we find in the Buddhist suttas already. Okay? So unlike the, the Dead Sea Scrolls from, from the Dead Sea, which taught something quite different from what you find in the Gospels, these suttas actually teach basically the same thing that you find in the, in the Pali Canon and the other early scriptures. So, which is subversive in its own way. It's subversive in a different way. Yeah? So, how we hide away our subversive texts in Buddhism is by putting them in a cabinet, putting them on the shrine, and worshipping them. Yeah? And this is how you hide away your, your, your disturbing texts. Yeah? You worship them. They're too holy to read. Yeah? You bow down to them instead of reading them because if you open them and read them, some of the things you'll find in there are a bit upsetting. Yeah. Like what? Oh, well, like it's the, the duty of, of monks and nuns to live in the forest and do meditation, <laughs> which is upsetting to the lifestyle of quite a few <laughs> monks and nuns. Uh, yeah, some things like that. Yeah. So this has always been my great love, my interest, is to, to try to marry these two things. Yeah? One is the, the experience that you actually have in meditation, primarily in meditation. Yeah, I mean, the whole life experience comes into it, of course, but the, the core of it is the experience in meditation with the, the, the teachings that we're reading in the suttas and so on. And uh, I've done quite a, lot, took quite a lot of research and quite a lot of effort over the years to, to actually dig this out. It's not at all obvious. And there are many, many things in Buddhism which are simply unknown and which not very much work has been done into. There are very few scholars and researchers uh, and a lot of, of uh, uh, scriptures. You know, when I say there's few scholars and researchers, there's, I mean, there's, there's maybe half a dozen academics in the world who are capable of reading and who are actually studying Buddhist, the, all of the Buddhist scriptures in, in the original languages, if that. 
I don't know if I could name half a dozen who are actually working at the moment who can do that. And so there's a tiny group of people working and uh, massive volumes of scriptures to work with. Yeah? So that project is something we can only do a little bit at a time. Meanwhile, life goes on, yeah? Meanwhile, greed, hatred, and delusion keeps on arising in the mind. <laughs> so you can't get too wrapped up in these kinds of things, yeah? It's only part of the enterprise, but for me, it's a very important part. It's, it's something that lends a, um, it's a check. It's a check. It gives, you, it gives you some context to work with. It gives you kind of a grounding in some kind of reality. So this is, if you like, this is the PR spin for, for uh, what I'm about, what I'm teaching and what, Santi, what I'm trying to do at Santi Monastery, is that we're trying to uh, investigate, resuscitate, revitalize uh, some of the, the quite amazing teachings which we find in the suttas and the vinaya, and then reapply it in a way which is... Uh, mm, relevant and important for people today. One of the ways that that's happened, of course, is through uh, promoting the bhikkhuni order and perhaps the major area where, where contemporary Buddhism has drifted the furthest from what the Buddha taught is in the treatment of women. And I'm not going to go into that in detail today, but uh, simply that my, my important my, my feeling is that this, that the revitalizing of the bhikkhuni movement is probably the single most important thing we can do to support the development of Buddhism in the proper way in the future. And one of the things that that requires is, is an understanding of the Vinaya text. Now, Vinaya we have is a code of discipline for Buddhist monks and nuns. And when we say code of discipline, it sounds like it's, it sounds a bit forbidding, yeah? We have this idea of vinaya, which is very uh, forbidding, lots and lots of rules. So you've got to keep all these rules about everything. But of course, when you look at the vinaya text, actually, that, well, this is one, again, one of the things that I found that is very nice, because what I found when I became a monk and I was living in a monastery is that often we would have to do things which would seem quite irrational and unreasonable. And as life went on, I began to realize that in almost every case, the unreasonable things weren't actually found in the vinaya, <laughs> and that the, the reasonable things were in the vinaya. But some of the things in the vinaya which are very subversive, uh, for example, like we talk about, um, these days we talk about in society, we talk about patriarchy. Yeah? So we believe that we live in a society that's come from a patriarchal background, we're trying to deconstruct that. We're trying to make things more equal. And, you know, obviously in terms of the social structure, the Buddhist monastic institution is a, almost a pure patriarchy. It completely denies any role for women in the patriarchy at all. But when we look at the vinaya, because we know what patriarchy means, it means like the, the rule of the fathers, yeah? Hierarchy means the rule of priests. And it's that archie bit which is a problem. There's nothing wrong with fathers, nothing wrong with priests. It's, it's the archiness of it, yeah. And if you, <laughs> and, and of course, which you know imposes the the, the 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 fallacy is of course that just reversing it. You know, if you have a matriarchy, it's still an archie, yeah. So it's not going to solve anything. But the interesting thing about the vinaya is the vinaya has no archie, right? It's an archie-free zone, right? And there's, there's, there's nothing anywhere in the vinaya which gives any power of command or order, right? So as, as this is, which is a very subversive way to run a community. So as an abbot, well, first of all, there's no abbots in the vinaya, right? Okay? So I'm in a very ambiguous position here because here I am. I'm the abbot of a monastery. Now, when we started the monastery, I said, I said to the committee and that, I don't want to be called an abbot. There's no abbots in the vinaya. You can call me the senior resident monk. 
And it's all right, I'll be called the senior resident. And everyone, after a while, everyone's getting, it's really sick of this. They can't call you senior resident monk all the time. It's really boring. So you have to call you the abbot. So I got used to being called abbot, which I think also abbot means father, doesn't it? Abba, Abba is a word they use for God, isn't it? Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's what it does. <laughs> Abba is father in Hebrew, so that's probably where it comes from, yeah? That's probably one of the words they use. Well, yeah, that has a certain... I mean, it was my favorite band for a period there. <laughs> Dancing Queen and Fernando. Mamma Mia. So... So, yeah, here I am trying to be an anarchist. See, that's what I'm, I actually am. I'm actually an anarchist, and the vineyard is actually an anarchist constitution. I, actually, I said this at a Sangha meeting we had at Wat Nanachat, because I come from this monastery, Wat Nanachat in Thailand. It's a very hierarchical monastery, which is set up on a very much a sort of top-down system. And we had a big Sangha meeting, and I said, well, actually, the vineyard is, is, is an um, anarchist document. Vinnie sets up the Sangha as an anarchist collective. There's a few kind of nervous titters around the room and we moved on to the next subject. <laughs> but it's true. So now I'm trying to run a monastery and sort of trying to be authentic to that. Yeah. So, so I'm an abbot, but I don't have any powers as an abbot. And I can't order anybody to do anything. There's no power of command. Now you take that seriously. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Yeah? And uh, of course, you, sometimes you have to do it anyway. Can't be I haven't managed to be entirely consistent in that, but you, you're trying and you're keeping that in mind. So when you say that there's no power of command, what that means is that it assumes that the people who are making up the Sangha, who are part of the community, are responsible and mature adults. Right? Which is not <laughs> which is which is which would be nice. And sometimes is the case, often, often is the case, but uh, not always, yeah? And so this is one of the things that we have to struggle with, yeah? To, 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 try to, to try to develop and move towards a situation where we can, can run a monastery based on these models, yeah? So again, this is this, this, these two things which I'm, I'm trying to point to here. One is that, that the actual living experience of what it's like and then the other one is, is, well, what is the theory? What are the texts saying? And just as I found in meditation, yeah, just as I found that in meditation there was an incredible congruence between um, my own experience in meditation and then what I found in the scriptures, in the texts that were talking about it, yeah, but a disjunct between what the text was saying and then what some modern teachers are saying, or certain aspects. I don't want to. I don't want to be too critical of what the modern teachers are saying. I don't want to. I don't want to. I'm not trying to pretend that that the, that that you know the, these these things are, are all wrong. Yeah. It's just that there are certain aspects to it, yeah, which I can't agree with. Yeah. Which is not to say that maybe 90% of what they're saying is is very good. Yeah. But there are some things which I couldn't agree with, and some things which need to be critiqued. And so the similar way I've found, not just in the the inner dimension of meditation, but also in the social dimension of building and constructing a community and a monastery, that the same thing applies, yeah? That there is a, uh, an amazing uh, set of, of, of principles, procedures, guidelines that we find in the, in, the, in the vineyard for running a community and helping a community to live, which actually works or can work very well with, with an actual community, but which is in serious ways dissociated from how Buddhism is actually lived in most monastic communities. So this is one of the things that we're uh, having to work with and certain and trying to, you know, we, we've been discussing this even the last few days we've been discussing this and I'll just, just give you one example. Uh, the first principle of Vinaya, the first principle of doing anything in Vinaya, any kind of, of procedure is called Sammukha Vinaya, which means uh, in the presence of. And so any vinaya procedure has to be done in the presence of, and that means in the presence of two things. One is in the presence of the dhamma, and the other is in the presence of the person. Yeah? So whenever, any, whenever we do any kind of procedure, first of all, we have to have the, the dhamma has to be there. That means we're not just 
uh, operating according to our own whims, but we have principles, we have procedures, we have guidelines, both in a general sense that we act with kindness, we act with compassion and so on, but also in a specific sense that there are specific procedures laid down that we follow, so we follow Dhamma, and also in the presence of the person. In other words, we don't talk about somebody when they're not there. Yeah? Which is pretty challenging, yeah? <laughs> it's not, not an easy thing to do uh, for anybody, yeah? But it demands a lot of integrity, and so often you find that, that it's hard. It's hard to do that. We have, and we haven't, you know, we haven't necessarily succeeded completely, but these are some of the things we're trying to, to put into place, trying to learn how to do, just like we try to learn meditation. We can read the theory of meditation, and it's very beautiful, yeah? Read the suttas, you know, the monk goes for arms round, comes back, sits down cross legged, goes into jhanas, abandons the hindrances, goes into jhanas, one, two, three, four jhanas, recollect the past life, boom, end of defilements, I'm an arahant. It's beautiful, yeah? It's terrific. Yeah? And then you, you start at the beginning and you see how far you can get. Well, I can work up the way to the bit where you sit down cross legged, except I can't do that bit anymore, I have to sit on a chair. <laughs> And, you know, and then, then things start to slow down a bit, you know. So it's the same thing with the, the, the vineyard is, of course, it's a great set of principles and guidelines, mm -hmm. but it's not immediately obvious how that can be applied. But that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to do. And, and that comes again from those two things, is the, the faith and the knowledge. So the faith aspect says, well, you know, when you, when you look at it, there's, this, there's a quality of, um, Buddhist scriptures I find are quite amazing. When I first started reading them, in a sense I was a bit disappointed because they weren't as, um, or many of them were, were not, were, were a bit, I found a bit bland or a bit, bit um, not as, like, perhaps not as clever as I'd expected, you know. I mean, I'd, 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 uh, I'd, be, I'd been kind of brought up studying literature and, and philosophy and so on. So, you, you know, you get used to reading things uh, that are very, uh, you know, um, you know, the, the Buddhist scriptures in, in a way are quite laid out in quite a plain manner, yeah? It's this teaching and then a simile and then a teaching and it's all quite... But once you get used to the idiom, well, the thing that I appreciate about it and the thing which is like almost this, this overwhelming impression of, of a... Um, it's very hard to describe, but this, this evenness of depth yeah, and appropriateness where, where everything, no matter what situation the Buddha's in, he responds in a way that's appropriate to that situation. Yeah. And it's, not, it's, a, it's a very subtle quality, a very gentle quality. It's not something which you know, immediately grabs you in one moment. Like you, know, you read some of these Zen teachings where something that just grabs you. Yeah? And it's just something, it, it's not, it's not, sometimes it is like that. But most of the time, it's not like that. Most of the time, it's just this evenness about it, which, I, which, which, which you learn to appreciate over time. And so this is what, as well as learning in the meditation context, I've also been learning and still continue to be learning in the, the context of community building and sangha building, uh, is to, to, to work with these principles and just to try to appreciate them and to see how this can be understood, how it can be applied, uh, and so on. So this is an ongoing uh, job. So if you like, this is the, uh, the PR spin for Santi Monastery and uh, what we're doing there. And like everybody else, <laughs> um, we're, saying we're doing the real thing. Yeah? This, is <laughs> this is real Buddhism. Yeah? And uh, um, who am I to say what's real and what's not? Um, so it's very, it's very, it's very difficult. You know, we only, we've only got, we, we look at the, the, these, these, these texts, Vinaya and Dhamma and so on, and they only give, you know, they only give certain kinds of information. You know, we can learn certain kinds of things from them, but they're, they're removed from their context. Yeah? And so we know that the context is so much richer than the and then what we have. We've only got a you know, it's as if you know we've only we've got a we've got a you know a set of instructions on how to build something, but we don't actually have the materials or there to build it. You just so 
it's not at all obvious how we need to be proceeding. And we just try bit by bit. We experiment, yeah? We, we, we work with the, the realities of, of people, yeah? Crikey, you know, what do you do with it, you know? Is there, they're not kind of, um, you know, ideal images, yeah? They, they're human beings who have their own glories and beauties and, and, and wonders and, and also their own issues and, and defilements and problems, yeah? And so we're dealing with that. What gives me continued faith? And continued, um, like the, the willingness and the wish to k to keep on doing that, is the the finding and the, the experience that whenever we do this and we, we 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 have the guts to stick with that sincerity and to actually do what we think the Buddha meant, then somehow it works. And somehow it comes out okay at the end. And you can see over, over time, gradually you can see, yes, that it does work. Yes, there is some results from it. And so this is, this is how faith should be working in Buddhism, is faith is, is something which is tested and confirmed by experience, not something which is you just do blind faith. So this is the difference with like a, a cult or something like that, where you can you get into it and you just have to commit yourself to 100% faith, and you know you don't get any feedback from that faith. You just have to believe. But in Buddhism, we test it each step of the way, and so far it seems to be working okay <laughs> for me anyway. Sure, other people don't, so that's fine. They find their own path. But for me, it still seems to be working. And it seems to me that we have a long way to go, uh, certainly in terms of that those con as the social aspects of community building. We're only just working out, what do we do with bhikkhunis? Maybe Ayeshe has some comments on that. What do, what do we do with building a community where we take women seriously and we actually listen to what they have to say as if they are sentient beings as well, just hypothetically. Uh, and how is that going to change the monks community? How is that going to change the relationship with the lay community and how that relates to the sangha and all of these things? These are things which we are finding out. Nobody knows the answer. And uh, I think it could be really amazing. I suspect. It could be, maybe it won't be, maybe it'll be really boring, I don't know. But it could be really amazing. So, uh, you know, all I can look forward to uh, in doing this process is to hope that, and, you know, this, this hope already has some um, seeds. There's always some, some, some seeds of fruition coming here. But to hope that the students who I'm teaching at the monastery and so on will, in their turn, be able to refute my teachings and to show me where I went wrong and how I've betrayed the Dhamma. Yeah? And if they can learn to do that successfully, then I'll be happy. Well, I'll probably be annoyed to start with, but then after a bit, I'll probably think, yeah, well, it's probably quite okay, yeah. Because that process needs to be keep going. It needs to be answered for each generation, yeah? And each, each generation has done this, yeah? And I think that's very important to remember. Some, we get this idea, which is this kind of orientalist idea that Buddhism is this kind of ancient thing which has lasted forever and it's always been the same. It's not the truth. It's, it's not like that at all. It's always changing, you yeah? You know, I can just look at my own teacher at Ajahn Brahm, and he's, he introduced a, a huge amount of very radical uh, innovations in his time, in the way he built his monastery and the way he teaches. A lot of the things that he does were not done at all before he came along. Yeah? And if you looked at Buddhism as it was taught, say, in the, in the West in the 70s and 80s, it uh, was very different to how Ajahn Brahm started to present things during the, the 90s. Yeah? It's a very major change. But now he's become the orthodoxy. Yeah? And so he's become the thing which we have to rebel against. 
and, uh, and so it goes down through the years. But at each stage, those two things, I think those two things remain. One is, what is our experience? What is our situation? What is our context? What is our life? And how can we use the teachings to pursue the Dhamma? How can we apply the Dhamma? How can we live the Dhamma within that context? Those two things uh, will always remain the same. So this is my little talk for you on the Santi Forest Monastery PR.